All right. All right. Hi, welcome to another episode of Scorpio Season. Um, I'm your host, Lisa, and I'm today, today I'm here with two very special guests, um, Venkat and Sonia Mann. Hey, Sonia. Hello. Thank you for having me on Scorpio Season. <laughs> we're, we're very excited to have you, Sonia. Um, it works out. So our, our letter today is the letter S. So of course, you were a natural choice for a guest. Um, yeah, cool. So Venkat and I have this thing where we usually have a snack that we show off. Um, so today, Venkat, what snack did you bring today? I have strawberries, S for strawberries. S for strawberries. Um, Sonia, I know, so not to put you on the spot, but do you have a, a snack that you brought for today? I did have sesame balls, but I must confess that I already consumed a sesame ball and put them back in the fridge. So I'd have to go get them again. <laughs> okay. I, I guess the thought I guess it's the thought that counts. Um I yeah. hope as long as your audience believes me, I think we're we're okay. Yeah, I think our audience We'll vouch for you. We saw you eat the sesame ball. This is true, we'll vouch. So they better I guess as long as they trust us. Trust oh, and you. we have a cat as a fourth or second guest. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's Polara. Uh, she finds my computer very interesting. Yeah, I hear that's a cat thing. Um, and oh, you I might have... see Lisa's dog at some point. She usually yeah. wanders in at the back somewhere. She's <laughs> out today. She got spayed this weekend. So she's just, she's kind of like chilling. This mm, she yeah. a little dopey. She's very dopey. dopey. She's so dopey, man. Yeah, she's super dopey. And she's wearing a cone, which she's just like, when she walks at all, she tends to kind of sprint. She does it in spurts because she, I don't know, it's like she's going to go to the place and then stop and it's all going to be okay. I don't know. We're having a moment. Anyways, um, great. So what topics do we have to talk about today, um, Benkat? Right. Uh, I think we had like half a dozen topics and mm -hmm. starting with, I think, salons and Sonia, actually. So maybe we should reverse that since Sonia is our guest um, this week and start with Sonia. So uh, uh, do you want to introduce her or should I? You go for it, Venkat. Okay, we can both try to introduce her. So uh, I've known Sonia for several years now, met her, I think, a couple of times, once in Seattle and once you came to a refactor camp. And Sonia has also written a bunch of essays for Ribbon Farm, including uh, a really good essay defining sort of the cyberpunk sensibility and what cyberpunk is. So, um, and she used to write uh, a great newsletter with kind of the best name ever called Excel Lymph. And she stopped writing that and I kept telling her that she should, the name is so great, you should just continue doing something with it. But now she <laughs> writes a newsletter um, that's just her name and produces a bunch of uh, zines and mm -hmm. runs some sort of like, I don't know, creative uh, curation thing. Like uh, there's a whole scene around Sonia where things happen. So yeah, that's my introduction <laughs> to Sonia. Lisa, you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I just wanted to point out that your introduction was very Scorpio-like because you focused on all the the um, things that you, like your beefs against Sonia, like the fact that she quit writing her cool <laughs> newsletter. Um, it was very, it was very appropriate. It was, yes. like, it was great. I don't think I have a lot to add to that. I don't have any beefs. <laughs> <I'm> sorry. <laughs> um, but I think you do point out a, a good point that I think Sonia, um, uh, I think you do a good job of kind of staying on top of a scene or sort of like, um, sort of fits with like our salon topic. I don't know. Do you want well, to thank yourself? you. Okay. Thank you for the very kind words. Um, I'm really terrible at describing myself. Um, I kind of like just like an internet personality, I guess. I'm a writer, question mark. Um, I, sometimes I write uh, essays that are like roughly in the, the insight porn genre. Um, I tweet hot takes of various sorts. Uh, that's like by far the most popular thing that I do is tweet hot takes. Um, and I'm, as Venkat mentioned, I make zines, which is definitely my favorite thing that I've been doing this year. Um, and working primarily with collage, which is like kind of a, a newish thing for me to be focusing on as a like making artifacts that I share with other people. 
as opposed to just Do you have as a like couple a, handy that you can show off for us in front of the camera here? Yeah. Um, would you guys mind chatting amongst yourself for like 30 seconds while I go grab yeah, them? Yeah, yeah. We'll yeah, wait we for you to okay. get the scenes. I'll, I'll be right back. Yeah, I think I have one of her early issues from, um, I think she started doing this last year. Yeah, I think I have her first issue, but now she's produced like one a month. And from looking at pictures, they're like really well produced. Have you seen them or? Yeah, I subscribed to Sunny's new newsletter. Oh, oh, okay. I think she does a good job of advertising, like showing off her stuff, or at least the covers. Yep. Um, yeah. So this is, sorry, <laughs> just plowing in and interrupting you, even yeah, though I have no I idea know, whether funny. you were mid-sentence or what. It's so good. Uh, um, what you got there, Sonia? <laughs> this is the most recent zine that I made. Um, it's about a seed fairy character called Plumule. Um, here, what's a good page? Here, I'll, this is as good a spread as I need to show you. So this is the kind of um, like texture. Yeah. Uh, and then this is, I mean, this is more traditional. This is from late last year. Yeah. Gosh, I'm so bad at like centering myself in the video. Yeah. Um, and this is a more sort of standard uh, kind of layout. Um, God, why, why? I have no yeah, intuition for whether I'm centered in the video. Um, <laughs> oh yeah, this one has some, has some art there. Um, so that's, yeah, that's what I've been making. And I, I really enjoy making artifacts. Mm. Um, and it's especially fun to, it's, I, I don't know, it's just really satisfying to make something physical. Um, yeah, it's fun. So when you send them out, they're all like copies. Like, so you make the collage and then you make a cut, like you scan it. Yeah, I it scan it and then I get them printed. There's this website, mixam.com. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to get zines printed, I've had really good experiences with them. Uh, the quality, like the, the quality for the price point is really quite good, which is, it's so, that did not used to be true. Like uh, say when I was making zines, um, oh, what, like five years ago, more than that, like eight years ago, it was not, it was not, it was, I think it was a combination of like, it was more expensive to do this kind of like getting a pamphlet printed on demand. Mm -hmm. um, there were less providers doing that kind of thing. Uh, and then also I personally just did not have the money to do that kind of thing. So I was like printing it out on my parents' printer, which is just the, the quality of products that you can make <laughs> definitely is not the same. So it's been really fun to get to see this kind of professional, like this professional um, level production. Yeah. How much does it cost? How many pages do you have in the one you showed us and how much did, this, did that cost? Um, I don't have the numbers for that one in my head, but the one that I just ordered that I haven't received yet was 12 pages, including like 12 sides, including the front and back cover. Um, and it was 4.75 inches square. And that was about, is like 173 or something like that uh, for 150 copies. So hold on, let me, I can tell you what that is roughly. Uh, so like 115 a, a copy. Yeah. yeah, less than a buck. Huh. Um, and then shipping them, is usually in the like one to two dollar. It depends on how long it is because it's weight based, but it's like one to two dollar range. And then it'll be like around five dollars international. Sometimes more. Uh, like if I'm, if it, like I said, it depends on length. So um, that's roughly the costs for the just like the physical part of it. Yeah, that's really cool. I have a question about like shipping stuff. Like, so my dad runs like a small business that, um, he ships people things through the mail and he's been getting a lot of complaints from customers that they're not getting their stuff because the shipping, like the mail service hasn't been working so great lately. Have you been noticing any problems with it also or have people mostly been getting the, the zines you ship them? If they haven't, uh, you know, one person missed out on something, but he said that he had had issues with his mail delivery. So it seemed to be like a specific to that situation. Oh. Um, I haven't had general complaints, okay. uh, but I also, I don't think like it's conceivably possible that they just wouldn't notice. Like I'm not, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I see. Okay. Yeah. But I, I want to like, just add a couple of um, things on this because this takes me back uh, when I was working at Xerox about 10 years ago, the, these printers were pretty new. Do you happen to know the equipment this was printed on? Was it a Xerox iGen or a Nuera or um, sorry, HP? It's probably an HP device. I think it, it's an HP like large format laser printer, but uh, yeah. so those, I'm not uh, sure machines, beyond that. Uh, those machines, um, they kind of really came up in the early 90s. They took a decade to get good enough and another decade to get cheap enough that you could use them for like anything other than like, you know, expensive direct mail. Like when I was working at Xerox, our biggest market was um, direct mailers. So like high color glossy things for typically real estate, banking, things like that. And those would end up costing like uh, several bucks. And I remember at that point, you know, still like, the technology was janky enough that the fuses would overheat and there were lots of problems and stuff. And it's now really gotten really good. But then when I go back to like how this stuff has evolved, the very first publishing thing I ever did was in high school in the eighties. And I put together the first science magazine for my high school. And the way I did it was, uh, do you, have you guys heard the term cyclostyling? So this is going to sound really ancient. Mm -hmm. Cyclostyling is this method of using like stencils that you, hammer out on a regular looking typewriter, but it actually marks it out as stencils. And if you want to like have illustrations, you have like these sheets or blanks with like three, sh three layers to them. And you have to like draw with like a pen, but really, really press really, really hard, like carbon copies. And then that creates this template. And then it goes into a machine called cycle styling machine. And then it sort of prints a bunch of like offset style sheets. It's really crappy, completely black and white. And uh, I printed like 50 copies for, uh, 50 rupees or something like that. It was r really ridiculous. But that was my very first zine publishing experiment and also my last because I decided I never wanted to do anything that messy again. But I might try it again. I think you've inspired me. It's, it's much, much less hassle now. <laughs> <laughs> Which, I, I mean, that to me, that's genuinely huge. Like, that's why I love, it's why I love the internet. It's why I love technology. Like, Generally, God, saying I love technology is such an I fucking love science kind of thing to say, <laughs> but hopefully you guys know what I mean by that. Just I love having what is possible for me to do unilaterally and like without having to coordinate with other people. The without having to coordinate with other people part is like really, really big to me. Like just the reduced friction. Um, it just makes such a huge difference. Sunny, would you call yourself an introvert? <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely an introvert. I do like other people, but I find them exhausting. I'm also an introvert. I think this is why I also like technology. Um, not to draw any masterful conclusions. Ah, so that, but, uh, this is three self-declared uh, introverts actually hanging out, which is yeah. slightly ironic. But yeah, I remember when you came to Refactor Camp, you kind of skipped the second day because you were um, like socialed out. But I mean, your job at uh, Zcash was like basically being super social, right? Like being the community evangelist and going to events mm -hmm. and stuff, like wasn't it super social? So it was exhausting? Yes, but online. Like I find it much, 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 like it doesn't even feel like the same thing to me, talking to people online versus talking to people in person. Um, like you don't have to pay that much attention unless you want to, you can switch around, but like you're not having your time and attention monopolized in the same way. Um, I don't know. It just feels qualitatively really different to me and I don't find it draining in the same way. What about you two? Uh, I, well, I think with people I know, I've gotten to know well, it's not draining. So like meeting new people is like significantly more draining. But once you've met people a couple of times, then it's actually relaxing to hang out and chat. Like um, mm. I think when we first met Lisa, that was also in Seattle, right? So that would have been a Probably, I don't remember, but it would have been a slightly high stress meeting for me because meeting anybody for the first time is slightly high stress for me. But after we hung out a couple of times, it was like, all right, this is like, I can roll with it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, but larger groups like meetups and refactor camp, um, they do tend to drain me pretty strongly. What about you, Lisa? For me, I have to be on some sort of stimulants to really enjoy um, <laughs> like coffee or chocolate or like 
exercise of some sort in order to really hit hanging out with people like smooth sailing um so yeah I mean I, I, it's like I really enjoy it when I'm in the right mood for it but getting myself in the right mood for it is a little bit of a finicky um negotiation I think Mm. The thing and stuff all over my shirt. Speaking guys. of hanging out and zines, um, when we were discussing having you come on, we were, uh, I was, I think I said something like zines are like asynchronous uh, salons on paper, which is like, especially the kind you do, right? Because you invite a bunch of contributors. It's not just you. You have a bunch of people contributing stuff. So it's like, you don't have to hang out in real time and be extroverts together but the zine is sort of your sort of asynchronous salon. Is that like a fair description of the process? Yes. Uh, although I don't, I don't exclusively do multi contributor zines, but that's more because like this year I've been doing like way, way more volume of zinage than in the past. So in the past, definitely it was mostly like uh, multi contributor things. And I still like, I still commission people and I also like I'll host guest posts and stuff. Like I really love, um, directing attention streams towards other people when I feel like they're, you know, worth paying attention to. Like, I just really enjoy sharing, like, look at this cool person doing this cool stuff. Um, oh, you were, oh, you were saying that a zine is like a salon on paper. Yeah. I, I love that way of talking about it. Um, there is, I, I've been so strongly influenced by the world of open source, um, which I think of, like, I think it has, some other similarity, like it also has something of that um, feeling to it where, I don't know, you, you have some project and the project ends up bringing people together around it. Uh, and then the, the connections from that unlock all sorts of surprising things. Um, like I would say the way that Ribbon Farms influence has rippled has been really interesting. And I'm sure even more interesting for you than for me watching it secondhand. Do you, I mean, do you think of yourself as a, sort of hosting a salon on, in the way that you've done guest writers and that kind of thing? I mean, retconning it, yeah, I would say looking back, it sounds like that. But uh, actually, uh, Lisa, what, what image did you have in mind when you picked the topic salon? Like people sitting on couches by a fireside or something? Like what were you thinking of with the topic? Yeah, so I think like, so I think I was kind of thinking of like old school I think I'm trying to think the last time I saw it referenced, but usually it has to do with um, like a society in a like an in, almost like intelligentsia of a city focused around gathering in someone's living room or like a particular house on like semi regular basis. Um, and like there's some amount of like social like the appearance of being in the salon creates like a scene for that like particular social group in that city. Um, I want to say. I'm really struggling to remember. I think it was like, I'm thinking like Weimar Germany had like salons. Um, mm -hmm. Like that was the thing that- Gertrude Stein in Paris. Was it in Paris? Or like the one about like this particular point about the um, the salons in like Weimar Germany where that the, the two women that hosted them were like Jewish by whatever. And so it was kind of like this weird, like if you were in the salon, you could kind of like, get away with um, flirting with these like boundaries around what was socially acceptable. Um, so like, I think some amount of being in the salon is also kind of like a little bit of edginess, like things mm. that are permissible there. Like, I don't know. It's almost like a, it has some, some temporary autonomous zone qualities. Yeah, exactly. Uh, sort of. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, that's actually a good, point because the salons I'm thinking of uh, some of them did have like um, strong sort of bohemian reputation or like you know edge progressive like the one I'm thinking of is the Bloomsbury set so this mm -hmm. was uh, 19 late 1910s uh, London it had Virginia Woolf it had John Maynard Keynes it had a bunch of like people who later became really famous and they were like yeah edgy radicals who invented um, modernist fiction among other things and Keynesian economics I guess uh, and, and but there's the physical space matters, right? These people had like a bunch of houses they used to hang out in. San Francisco has uh, the Long Now uh, Lounge, right? I've been there once. Uh, have you guys been there? Yeah, the interval at the Long yeah, Now go. is that what you're talking about? Yes, yeah. I have been there, and it's definitely a scene. <laughs> <laughs> it's really charming. 
<laughs> it's great. Yeah. But I feel like it's one of those you could just like look around and be like, oh, who's here? And you're like, oh, I know that person from Twitter. And there it's like so and so. And it's like, you're like, oh, this is where y'all all hang out. I mean, it's a great bar to hang out at. Um, they have like alcohol hanging from the ceilings. It has, there's reasons that it's hanging from the ceilings, which I can never remember. I don't know. It's like a, uh, it's a, a certain, like it's a certain donor level. You get to have one okay. of the, I think it's like you can get gin or a few other like hard liquors. And if you donate a certain amount, you get to have your own personal ver like thing hanging up there on the ceiling. Yeah. I feel like the, the thing with the interval with the long now, though, that I would say makes it a little less salani than, like, these other things is, like, how formalized it is, and it has, like, rules and, like, a membership and, like, a, like you know, you can, like, buy into getting your alcohol hanging from the ceiling as, like, a decoration, whereas, like, a, a salon feels a little more, like, informal-ish and yet also, like, established. Is there a distinction between a salon as an event as opposed to something like a social club as a place, right? Because mm -hmm. a turn of the century, London had um, its whole club scene, Sherlock Holmes belonged to a club and that kind of thing. And mm -hmm. that's really not an event. It's a place that you just show up at regularly and have drinks and read and meet people and you run into them. Whereas a salon, I think, has connotations of, yes, it's a place and a setting, but it's also kind of like a particular kind of curated ongoing discussion, like something like that. So there's like, it's somewhere between a place and an event, I think. I think, a, I think of a salon as like, th this is a thing that like Silicon Valley people do, which is where they'll invite a bunch of people over for dinner, like, you know, a hand selected group of people for dinner to talk about like some topic or other. It'll be like a themed dinner party kind of. Um, where everybody has like an intellectual group conversation over dinner and wine and et cetera, et cetera. Um, somehow it sounds kind of cringe to me when I spell it out like that, but maybe it's because the people being invited are like startup founder, startup founder, product manager, someone who works at an NGO. Like it's never actually exciting people. And no offense to people with jobs, like some of you are cool, but... <laughs> I think that's definitely, there's an element of truth to that. There's, there's sort of an aspirational snobbery to even using the word salon to describe what you do, right? And like, I'm trying to think where I lived in Seattle, right next to Pike Place, like close to where you and I met up for our coffee, Sonia. Um, in Pike Place itself, just above um, the fish market area, there's a second floor club i guess it's i forget what it's called but um it had an open house for membership at some point and my wife and i we went in to check it out uh, it looks like they were struggling for new members or something so it's kind of like a co-working space but it has like a big library you can go and hang out there. but it's an old school hundred year old club and it had this whole musty hundred year old feel to it as in the building and setting and library was kind of musty all the existing members were like these 60, 70 year old white people. And it was like, it, it seemed like a scene transported from 1920s London and it was and with the same people who had now grown to ancient people. So that was kind of a disappointment to me because uh, as a reader, I enjoy fiction from that era. Like, you know, Agatha Christie and P.G. Waterhouse, like uh, fiction set in that era and it's really fun and I often imagine myself I would like to belong to a club like Mycroft Homes and it's like you actually go check these things out and they're like these I don't know let downs so I, I don't think I'd actually want to belong to any club not even just the ones that would have me <laughs> <laughs> mm, yeah but I feel like so I feel like the clubs that I, I belong to these days all exist like ephemerally on Twitter um I'd really like there to be a physical hangout space that I could go hang out in. Um, I have some friends here in town in Houston that like we joke about buying like some of the bars that have gone belly up um, recently and like opening like a witch coven upstairs kind of thing and like making it like the southern southern salon or something. But um, that's actually kind of you can do like a kind of funny wordplay on saloon salon. Maybe that only works in Texas, oh. but um, like uh, yeah anyways but uh I feel like hanging out on Twitter is like I definitely have like places on Twitter that I go hang out that I feel like I'm in a salon or maybe not even on Twitter but also like on discord um just like little places that are like I don't know like hangout spots that you spend time and you see who's there and like chit chat 
do I, you need a physical so, space, right? Like our text and Discord type things, do they feel salon-like to you? Like Zoom feels a little bit salon-like. I guess I haven't mm-hmm. tried the, keep forgetting, uh, club, uh, Clubhouse. Yeah, I haven't gone there and I refuse to go, but um, I think these are attempts to go more salon-like, is it? Mm. Uh, in my personal experience, I think Clubhouse is the thing that gets closest um, although there's no reason why a Discord channel couldn't, it's just like less, I don't know, maybe, I, I'm just like personally not an audio first person. <laughs> so like I only listen to Clubhouse when there's like some drama popping off because otherwise it's just like not interesting enough. <laughs> People talk too slowly. Um, where was I going with this? Oh, um, I, I wanted to bring up earlier that one of the other themes uh, ties into salons also, which is salience. Like I think one of the things that makes a salon a salon is that it has some sort of implicit salience with respect to, I don't know, like creativity or the bleeding edge or uh, which kind of goes into what we were talking about earlier with the, like there's this connotation of kind of, I don't know, mild transgression, sort of like bougie transgression. <laughs> Is a salon a place where you go to deliver your hot takes? Like you said, you, you describe yourself as a take mm-hmm. person. Is a salon the venue for takes? I like that. Mm-hmm. I like it. It's like, it's like the, the platform that you try out your takes on, sort of, or like location where you... A, a takes workshop. <laughs> Though you have to like qualify that a bit because there's an there's a connotation of intimacy to a salon that's missing in like true take culture. Like when I go and I seriously intend to post a take on Twitter, the intent is for it to go viral and have a thousand people read it, right? Whereas if you actually want to do a salon level take, it's not a hot take. It's more like a warm take that you only want to share with like maybe a dozen people at most. And more than that, it's like you're doing some public blo- broadcast. Thinking about my salon experiences and oh Venkat I agree that it has like I think IRL is irreplaceable like I don't think it's possible to replicate the same thing because we are physical creatures like we are embodied creatures um but anyway oh gosh I keep getting sidetracked from what I was trying to say or what I meant to say I don't know one of you talk okay Sonia I wanted to like jump back a second I'm sorry this is definitely not going to help you remember what you're trying to say but like when you said you only like listening into clubhouse when it's popping up how do you know it's popping up do you get like a notification is there like a like a alarm that goes off somewhere that's like now on clubhouse (laughs) like shit going down so you do get notifications about the conversations that are happening and who's in them so like if there are two people who you write, who you know have some kind of beef and they're in a conversation together, you're like instantly interested. Um, and then also the other thing is that like five minutes afterwards, people will immediately start like subtweeting about it. So you can find out that way. Gotcha. Okay. Does the clubhouse have yeah. recordings or is it like live? Like you have to be there when it happens. Um, it's live, although you can't like it, it's not recording is not like a native feature. You theoretically can record it just cause it's like, it's audio, you can record it, but, uh, it is, it's not really done at the moment. Well, uh, I saw a couple of leaked transcripts of, um, the big Balaji versus what's her name, uh, Taylor Lawrence blow up. Right. So that's yeah. must have recorded that and posted it. Yeah. Yeah, I assume they just like had the phone yeah. and just like recorded the audio. So that putting it in our salon context, so it's a salient hot take that made it into sort of a warm take environment and then blew up. It's like if we, if it were a physical setting, it would be like the interval lounge having like a nice conversation with half a dozen people, then suddenly two people started fighting and like 200 people swarmed in to listen, right? So that, that Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, there are these weird, like, scale-bending things that the internet does that, like, don't really fit with our analog assumptions about, like, ba- the boundaries of a social situation. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Okay, here's, like, a kind of open question. How do you know what's going to be, like, I guess, how do you know it's salient? That seems sort of dumb because, like, you would think that salience is sort of self-describing, right? Um, no, salience is contextual. It's salience too. Like that's why I love the word salience is because you have this, uh, uh, like it takes on the connotations of salient. 
So like salience just means significance or importance, but because of this word salient and the way that we use that in other contexts, like such and such a thing that I'm bringing up is salient to this situation because blah, 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 blah. So salience is like this contextual uh, contingent kind of importance where it's like the salience is like within, within a given complex system or within a given context, I guess. Um, so that's what I, or at least that's what I mean when I say salience and I'm just like asserting that that's the definition of it. But um, I, that's why I think that salience is this like interesting alternative concept to importance because our importance has like, um, I don't know, it, it feels like it implies objectivity to me that like this is an accurate ranking of how important things are. Although of course you can talk about importance to this or that goal or like importance with respect to a certain value or whatever. Um, but I love the idea of salience as this like importance with a butt attached or like importance with caveats or something. Um, huh. Yeah. So I anyway, what do you guys think of that? Plus adjacency, right? So the, um, there's like right now we are talking about salons and salience and there's many things that are adjacent to this cluster of topics we're talking about, but many of them are kind of like, uh, um, adjacent but not salient like we had a casual remark on gin hanging from the walls of uh, the interval and that doesn't feel mm. exactly salient we could veer off into a conversation about alcohol but that would be like a side trail it wouldn't be salient whereas if i if we said something about like you know uh, something else about that like oh scotch and expensive liquors set a certain tone for a conversation and it becomes you know highfalutin or something that would be salient thing thing say, right Prestige signals. Oh, yeah, yeah. So that would be a salient observation to make. Uh, what's salient to salience? Well, one thing that I find vexing is that I feel like it, like, I feel like it, it just kind of depends on your goals or like people's, people's values dictate their goal or preferences, maybe preferences is a better word than values. Um, so like the, what is salient to me, it might not be salient to somebody else or, mm -hmm. or there's also like a personally, everyone's on their personal journey aspect of this where like, uh, say as a writer, um, if I'm thinking about like, do I want to write about this theme or this topic or whatever? Um, one of the questions I ask is like, does it feel, or one of the questions that sort of plays into my motivation is, does it feel salient to me? Like, is it, um, I guess both, like both in, I, important plus adjacent does feel like it's really getting to something. And I, I, I what you're bringing up like is actually, um, it's something slightly more subversive where the subjectivity is not an aspect of salience, but it's an attempt to claim the salience. So the phrase you used as a writer, so it can be a very aggressive move, uh, move right? If a bunch mm. of people are talking about something else altogether, let's say we are talking about COVID and the conversation is mainly about doctors and healthcare workers. And I were to button and say, as a blogger, it feels to me that people should really report more about what's going on in ICU so I can blog about it. So that's like a mix of writing myself into the narrative and almost grabbing the salience into my subjective domain. So that it's like salience is, uh, salience is a contested turf. Like people are, fi are fighting to be the center of salience or something. I... Can we see it as a scarce resource? I think so. It's collective, attention. It's, like, it's collective attention, right? There's a dozen people in a salon sitting there talking about something and the least uh, sort of socially, I don't know, or the most awkward people tend to like unwittingly draw the conversation somewhere else or uh, it's often assholes who want to do it deliberately as well. So yeah, I think there's competition for collective attention or something. I feel like there's an element of, of indexicality in this. And maybe this is just like, this is one of my new hammers. So I want to like, <laughs> you know, hit every nail with it. Um, but there's like, there's a pointingness in salient. I guess it's, it's like you say, it's the directing of attention or well, I mean, it's like an assertion. It's like, we should pay attention to this. Yeah. Um, and then the should becomes, uh, I don't know, is maybe that's what can be contested or what is like implicitly introduces a contest. Yeah. I think if you think about courtroom settings, that sheds light on what you're talking about because in courtrooms, there's like very rigorous procedure about where you can and cannot go, right? So one of the objections that the opposing lawyer might make is irrelevant and fishing expedition. These are actual objections you can raise and the judge can 
say, all right, keep it in or something like that. So yeah, salience is sort of a, a slightly adversarial move to expand or move the terrain of discussion or something. So in a courtroom setting, you want to move the conversation to where it's helpful to your client. Mm, yeah. How does this, so how does it, I mean, this is something that is obviously an aspect of the, like the attention wars on Twitter and then like the, the to what extent is the culture war kind of an attention war? I mean, that's, that comes up in your internet of beefs analysis is like, you have these sort of, there's just all this attention competition. Then you have all these like emergent, like clustering dynamics that come up on top of it. Like the, so when Lisa, when you were saying like, you feel like you're in these various like ephemeral clubs, mm -hmm. it's sort of like an emergent density cluster is like the sort of Twitter equivalent of a salon. I mean, it's not really exactly the same, but like it has some, some of that same like their friction and like having the particles all like bounce up against each other in this like contained space. Yeah, I think that's true. Um, I kind of want to start linking this to like the next topic we have on our list just for like um, maximum je ne sais quoi. Um, like in the, like, so the next topic we have is schools. Um, so like to what extent does like salience then define a school, right? Like a school becomes that like friction boundary that you're talking about, Sonia. Um, like the the like a school of thought so to speak right it pops up around a salient like a salient thing becomes a school of thought because everyone inside of that school bound is bounded by the particular thing that was salient to them about like whatever particular feature of whatever it is that they like i don't know the topic is about oh. i think you just described an evolutionary trajectory like you know scenes become salons that find salient topics and then evolve into like schools that endure for generations, right? So we're at the end point of the evolutionary path here talking about schools. <laughs> Have, I mean, if we were going to start a universe, like what is, I don't, so you have like, you have your sort of Lambda school-esque like let's disrupt education, which is a good is like a sort of explicitly careerist path, which is like you want to get your certifications and like prove that you can do X, Y, Z so that people will want to hire you. Um, but there's also the question of replacing like the university, the sort of the, the, the salon-y types or the salon-ish aspects of academia, um, how to replace those or how to like build our own versions of those is something that I know that a lot of people have been thinking about. Um, and to some extent, like projects like the Long Now or the kind of emerging progress study scene is along these lines. What do you two think? Um, uh, it's interesting to watch got, Lisa think. I know. <laughs> um. I mean, I always have like a million things to say, so that probably is a bad thing. I, I don't have to stop to think. Uh, but, but yeah, this is actually a good comparison because uh, I, I mean, you didn't go to college and you've kind of like crafted uh, what I think of as like a college equivalent liberal education for yourself. So I'm at the other end of the spectrum. I have like way too many degrees that I don't use and probably don't deserve. Uh, so what, what you've hung out with a lot of college people and how do you sort of compare your experiences of getting to a holder, you know, like 25 or something with their experience? 26. 26. So when you see your peer 26 year olds uh, who've been to college, how do you sort of get a sense of their socialization versus yours? I mean, I definitely feel pretty different from a lot of people. I, it, do, I mean, it does feel like kind of a defining difference. Now I'm thinking about like, do I even know if every, which of my friends went to college and stuff? Um, and I guess like, it, it feels like, it feels like the actual schism is like people assuming that you could have gone to college. Like I basically I buy the the Brian Kaplan theory of higher ed that it's mostly about 
um, like vetting human capital to talk about it in like the most sociopathic way possible. But, like I think it really is like mainly a filtering and sorting thing. Um, and there's just been this like runaway signaling uh, and it's kind of starting to break down and not, and also it's like, it's useful to the extent to which is, it is exclusive, I guess is, is my theory. Um, so like if you make college free for everyone, uh, that's not going to have the effect that the people who want to make college free for everyone think that it will have. That's what I think. Um, so I don't Let me ask you a diagnostic that, question. Like I think uh -huh. the salon or a sort of soft side of school is partly that you're thrown in with this bunch of people for four years very intensely. And when you leave, you are really glad to see 99% of them go and you never have to see them ever for the rest of your life. So when I think back to my college years, I have, I think two friends I've kept up with, that's it. Like people I enjoy keeping up with. The rest I might occasionally sort of um, like one of their LinkedIn things, but for the most part, and no offense to them, I'm glad they're no longer in my life. So do you, in your 18 to 22 time period, without the context of college, what percentage of people who are important or significant in your life or salient in your life in those four years are now people you've kind of left behind and are glad you don't have to deal with? Because if you don't, if you haven't left anybody behind, you haven't had, I think, the essential college experience, which is hating a bunch of people and leaving them behind. No, I actually, so I think I have had that experience, maybe not with the same intensity because, and that sort of makes sense that like, because my associations have been less arbitrary than mm -hmm. the, like who you get lumped in with in college, there's sort of perhaps correspondingly less uh, like, man, these people are awful, but I do definitely feel like I graduated, I like graduated out of several <laughs> phases kind of, or like social phases. Um, I would say, like, I, I still feel like I'm learning and growing and all that. Um, but definitely, I mean, the, yeah, I, especially thinking about, like, how many of the people I've met uh, would I make any kind of effort to maintain the relationship? Um, and I think it is a, like, similarly small amount of people. <laughs> um, maybe, but maybe more than you get out of college. It's just hard for me to know without actually having the counterfactual. But um, Let's get to n equal to two here. So Lisa, how many people from college have you kept up with versus hated and dropped or what's your ratio there? I don't know. <laughs> uh, probably less than five. Okay. So, I mean, I think like a lot of it I found is like location dependent. Um, I kind of like graduated from college and then rocketed off to New York City shortly thereafter and like on, like, so I think I cut most of my college ties pretty definitively, sort of by accident. It wasn't intentional, but like I moved to New York City and got off of Facebook at the same time, um, which like Facebook it was like, like huge. Weird. Everyone, what? <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it wasn't intentional. It just I don't know. It just happened. Um, yeah. So I don't. I mean, I keep up my friends here in town or people I knew in college, but we weren't like super close. I don't know. It's, college is kind of like this amor. Like my col my my college friend set kind of feels like this amorphous like uh, shadow network that like if I ever needed every once in a while I kind of like fall back into it or rediscover it or like remember that it even exists um, in like weird ways. But like other than that, it's like not very much in the background. Yeah. Uh, actually, I had a good test of it. Like I exaggerated. I, I like most of them. I. I think I had like a proper annoying beef with maybe one or two of them. Most of them are just in the apathy zone. It's like if they come to town and look me up and it's convenient, like more than less than five blocks away, I'll go meet them for coffee. More than five blocks, I'll probably blow it off. Um, but uh, when I started my blog, since I had no audience and there was no Twitter at that time, 2007, all these sort of promotional mechanisms were still starting out. Uh, so obviously I did the first thing, which was spam everybody who was sort of on already in my email list. And that was a good test of how many people transitioned from being uh, uh, college or grad school friends into being sort of readers and sort of part of my new social media life. And I think the total is less than 10, like two people became regular readers uh, from undergrad, maybe a couple of people from grad school. 
actually that's it so less than five probably yeah I so that transition like how many people that. can you carry over to your opt-in life is a good mm. test yeah but how big was your sample set like 100 200 like it- oh god uh, several hundred yeah because uh Oh, yeah. I mean, these things exist, right? Like you go to college and somebody makes an alumni email list. So you're on the list and people occasionally email it with like some update news. But typically after the first few years, everybody gets their own life and the lists become very inactive. So that's been the state for me for like 15, 20 years, except for a few people. Nobody sends to those lists anymore. Yeah, all the lists are dead by by now. This jump aspect you make is really interesting in terms of like, I, well, I thought it's sort of like, this is sort of like a tangent a bit, but I definitely think about it in terms of like social networks. Um, like, so there's definitely like an aspect of like a thing will develop on one network and then figuring out how to make it jump to other networks is like kind of a, um, like an interesting phenomenon that you can see. Like, um, I mean, it kind of is a similar thing, right? You have like a social network and then you want to see if it ports over to a different like platform or medium. Um, it kind of sounds like you're trying to take your in real life like college network and transition it onto like reading your blog um you can kind of see it with like when what was it like so i think the thing that i that kind of made me start thinking about it was like what dances from tv shows were making it into Fortnite, which i don't even know if Fortnite is a thing anymore but it's like all those like like little cultural things that were like maybe i think there was like some urkel like some character from like uh i can't even remember the show that urkel is in um like, but there was some dance, a character in this, like, old 80s, 90s TV show that, like, got re, like, created, like, made the jump to Fortnite, right? And so then became, I don't know if you call that salience or, like, still relevant because of being able to make the jump. That's totally a salient signal. Like, the Fortnite people pick this dance and they then introduce it, like, here, this is now important and relevant within your context, Fortnite players. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it's like a weird cultural transmission. Salience is like this weird cultural transmission between platforms, right? And like, so different things make the jump between different platforms, but it's not, it's really hard to tell what that thing's going to be. It's like sort of an emergent property of like these different networks and stuff, sort of. And sometimes things mutate as they jump or mutate after jumping. Yeah, exactly. I think you've uh, kind of hit on the connection between... um moving relationships versus moving salience and context, which I think ends up being moving uh, things like memes almost. Like when I think of the people uh, from college who ended up reading my blog as well, there was a little bit of like almost repotting a plant. It was like our previous relationship context was school and bitching about courses and classes and professors together. And then the new context was, oh, this thing that we used to spend like maybe 5% of our time talking about before is now the seed of the whole new context, like science fiction and stuff like that, right? Like maybe you talk about science fiction with a college friend and then later on that becomes 90% of your relationship instead of 5%. So yeah, I think that's happened with, uh, uh, yeah, all the friends I've managed to move across networks that a kind of like almost a meme moves with them. Like say, uh, Urkel is a meme, right? The dance is a meme that managed to move 20 years and several media. So yeah, I think that there has to be memetic reporting of some sort. I like the Urkel example because it also points to how there is an element of serendipity to this. Like, you know, maybe this is pure conjecture. I could be completely wrong, but it is certainly possible that, you know, whoever is curating Fortnite dances, maybe they just have an effect or maybe someone on the team who is, you know, like talking about this at some meeting has an affection for the Urkel dance and brings it up and people think it's funny and then, um, but you know, whether something like that is successful is depends on like how well it competes in the environment that it's then unleashed into. But there is this like, it, it does remain that like if the Urkel thing hadn't been chosen and reintroduced, they probably wouldn't take off in this new environment. But maybe the thing that makes it take off in the new environment is also what made it so beloved that it would be chosen. Um, I don't know. It's kind of hard to disentangle those things. I I wouldn't say it's necessarily beloved, though, because in the process of moving things, things can actually change their, well, valences, which is an adjacent concept to salience, right? Like, that's how camp is created. Like, uh, have you guys read the article by what's her name um it's called sontag. Notes on, yeah sontag the notes on camp right it's like i read going, it because you assigned it to me oh, and it's I so t- good <laughs> uh, but that's an example of like uh, 
shifting contexts and what is salient about it. Like Star Trek um, original series was not as campy when it first aired in the 60s or whenever, or 70s was it. But now it's, nobody watches the original series except as camp, right? So it's, it's connotation shifted from, I don't know, not camp to camp. Speculative and, to camp, yeah. yeah. And Urkel to, no, Urkel was uh, campy even when the show was airing, but I don't know, now what it is, I don't know. Like, uh, this is something I think about um, for myself. Like, uh, I can see some stuff that I've written 10 years ago be read in a very different light mm. right now. And it's not always a more flattering light. It's like um, suddenly it's being talked about as, um, I don't know, an obsolete out of touch take. Uh, takes expire, right? I mean, something I wrote in 2011, some younger, more savvy person with, in the 2020 context reads it. It's like, what's this old bullshit, right? So they're like, hey, this isn't salient. <laughs> Or it's salient in a negative way, right? It's, it's like, like an example of what salient, not to do. Right? Yeah, it's yeah. like, yeah. It will happen yeah, that's to true. There is... I said it will happen to you too. <laughs> well, and haven't you also, I assume, tell me if I'm wrong, haven't you also seen like concepts, you've coined a fair few like concepts and terms that have taken off in, you know, to varying extents. Have you seen them mutate? Like, do people start using them to mean different things from like what you precisely meant? I mean, I've seen that happen to a bunch of people's concepts, so I assume it happens to yours too, but I don't actually know. No, actually, in I've my case, it, it tends not to either. because uh, I think I already start out by typically abusing an existing contact uh, concept and I start that process. But we talked about one last week, Lisa, the red pill, right? Uh, red pill was a meme in the matrix that meant a certain thing. And now it's this weird sort of schizophrenic thing that means uh, men's rights in one context and um, sort of a symbol of uh, Only like, transgender women in another. I don't know. I refuse to admit that it means like the men rights thing because like I like it just as a general term. I, I refuse to like let that happen. Um, but I wanted to say I think that your premium mediocre has definitely been, um, I can't remember the term we were using for it, but like reverted. Like I've definitely seen articles about premium mediocre that had to do with um, nothing about mediocrity, more about um, the premium like luxury goods that look like media mediocre things that was like a that, was, that was part of what i intended i mean i had like a larger theory and that but people picked up on that so that's i would say concept drift like uh, if mm. i'd like draw a big circle and i'm claiming this turf as referring to my concept uh somebody might pick up like one corner of it and sort of reduce it to that or like drift slightly out whereas i think they decide for themselves what is salient about whatever you've presented yeah. yeah. Whereas I think actual sort of uh, recoding of a concept is kind of different, like where it like means a whole different thing that's almost clashing with what it originally meant. So that's, I think, rarer. Yeah. Like the uh, a famous example is meritocracy, how that's sort of a valence or that's gone through like multiple valence flips. Yes. Oh, another one is woke, which we will get to at W, right? So when it first started being used in 2012, 2013, I was like, yeah, of course I'm woke. Who wouldn't stand for these values of like social justice, blah, blah, blah. Now I'm like, okay, I don't want to touch any of these things it supposedly means with a 20 foot pole, right? Huh. Oh. Huh. And it's funny that there, there's an alternate use of the word woke in the like conspiracy theory world where it means like, you know, uh, it means something similar to like noited. <laughs> With, but that usage has now been like completely swamped because yeah. like woke as in like wokeism or the SJWs or whatever you want. Um, it's interesting that SJW has become like, I feel like it's kind of passe now. Like none of the cool people say SJW anymore. What's up with that? Wait, did they ever? I think I didn't ever say that. that. I'm gonna put myself oh, in the cool people. That one I think right got there. taken over by its uh, opponents, right? Like when I first saw the term crop up around 2012, 2013, it was being claimed as a badge of honor by activists. Then at some point it became used as an insult and people started like saying, resisting it and saying, don't call me an SJW, that's a slur. So it's like, uh, I don't know who legislates these things, but at some point it flipped 180 degrees. These emergent things are so interesting to me. It's not like anyone ever gets to like definitively declare like 
this is how we're looking at this term and this is what it's like social implications are going to be all of that just kind of happens yeah. markets man I don't know. I feel like any acronymization of anything is just bad news. Like anytime <laughs> you like take a thing and you make an acronym out of it and then try to like, and then that becomes the thing that the culture like attaches onto. I'm just like, that's not, that's not. I'm not. <laughs> that's why the, the military and business school, actually what they're suffering from is excessive acronize, acronymization. <laughs> and uh, if, that, if this were cur- curtailed, civilization would be saved. I think I think that's all we need, really. Yeah, it's really hard, though. Like, um, if there's the acronyms that end up being like buzz phrase kind of things, but then there's lots of like deep technical stuff that just simply becomes inefficient if you don't have like lots of um, acronyms to talk about them, right? Uh, so anyway, yeah. Like all these like multi-hyphenated physics terms that you have to like refer to a zillion times or something. Yeah. Yeah, no, I get that. There's so genuine try, Like uh, Elon Musk sent a famous memo uh, at Tesla saying there's only two acronyms allowed to be used. And he had a couple, but um, he hated acronyms because at some point an acronym, acronym culture means a bureaucracy is really emerging. Like at Xerox, we literally had an internal server uh, for looking up the uh, TLAs. They, it was first introduced to me as, oh, the, you should check that out on the TLA server. And I'm like, what the hell is a TLA server? And they're like, three-letter acronym because Xerox loves three-letter acronyms and there's a whole freaking database of PLAs. So that was a learning curve for me. <laughs> oh, that is, um, that's just so classically giant company. Yeah. I think, Venkat, isn't that one of the things that like was one of the themes from especially earlier Ribbon Farm that really resonated with people was this sort of like irreverent but incisive theorizing of like the interior of large organizations and the, the I mean like obviously the Gervais principle was really influential here but there are a bunch of other like there are a bunch of other posts that are about like why the fuck are large organizations like this <laughs> I mean that was something like say writing about illegibility that was something that I found really clarifying was like why you know why are why are large institutions so stupid and inefficient and your blog points out like a number of answers to that question, most of which like kind of invalidate the premise, but that's what's cool about it. So it's, um, so it's kind of interesting that um, to each generation, it seems new, but if you look at like business satire as a genre, it's, it's actually jumped networks and media for over a century, right? I mean, the classic medium is the panel, three panel or three panel cartoon strip like Dilbert or something. But yeah, you have Parkinson's law, as a book and that was a genre of like uh, satirizing management but I think uh, the interesting thing for me writing those things at that time was this was when employees of big companies were first discovering what the line is between acceptable and not acceptable things you could say on personal blogs while being a full-time employee at a company and at that point most people were like dead scared of like losing their jobs. Like the precedents hadn't been set. So I think the first part of the JVS principle I wrote in 2009. And the only reason I was willing to do it while fully employed was my manager loved me and my projects were going well. So I was like firing on all cylinders at work. So nobody, I, I wasn't exposed. Like people couldn't take something I did outside and use that as a reason to like, you know, get me fired or anything. Whereas, uh, so, but I think now 10 years later, that's become such an established part of culture that previously you would have to like quit a job to become a comic strip artist, or you would have to quit a job and then write like a business satire book. Now it's like almost like um, a check and balance force where a certain amount of like satirizing business as it plays out live while you're still working. I think that's become a thing and that's very new. It's only in the last 10 years that you can kind of do that. Like uh, actually, walk the fine line between getting fired and maintaining a hedge option where they don't dare to fire you because then you have like, you know, you, I think you have a case. Like, even, this makes me think of sort of, there's like this like Silicon Valley employee Twitter, which is kind of different from tech Twitter, like with VCs and stuff. Cause the employees kind of as a class, as a group, both have like have different demographics and also like different obvious different incentives and like skin different kind of skin in the game. Um, and one thing that's been interesting is that like you can get job opportunities 
or you know other sort of other you know ab like you can get potentially like an in to a seed round or something from cultivating status in this like social scene of fang employee like fang plus well-funded startups mm -hmm. like the employees um you can uh and one of the ways is like i think maybe by doing some sort of counter sailing along those lines where it's uh like the more you get away with roasting Silicon Valley companies, the more social status you get. And it's like, it's almost like a proof of work that you can ride the fine line uh, between what is acceptable and unacceptable. <laughs> and then it's very salon-like. Oh, so yeah. it is, it circles back around. Yeah. Right? So there's yeah. a salon of like critical sort of uh, opinion writing about like a core of a powerful institution. Actually you two are, uh, sort of best position to discuss sort of the extreme version of that, which is if you have like a big powerful corporation that can fire you and ruin your life, then you're very careful about what you can do. If you have like a newer second generation industrial corporation with like an ecosystem around it, you have a little more power. But if you're working in say the crypto space where all the actual institutions and companies are like these tiny little islands in this vast ocean of like open source and like free agent stuff, mm -hmm. I think it's very different, right? So uh, I mean, uh, Lisa, you're sort of uh, employed at a company that's a small company within the much larger Bitcoin ecosystem. So you, as part of your job, you have to be talking both in the Bitcoin larger ecosystem and in inside companies, right? So what's the difference between those two? Like uh, you contributed to open source Bitcoin stuff and yeah. So what's the cultural difference in talking critically in public about both? Mm, you know, <laughs> I feel like I don't talk critically in public about either of them. Um, like, I could, I guess. Is I that could, on purpose? Yeah, sometimes. I could if I want to, but I think, like, even, I think earlier today I deleted a, a, a tweet thread that I had about a thing that was criticizing a different company in the space based on stuff I had done at a previous work job thing that, like, not lit. I don't think I was going to reveal any, I don't think I was going to, like, tweet any particular amount of dirt but I was like eh this like I could like not contribute this <laughs> and it like things would be okay so yeah I do like I mean I think a lot you, about I, I think you sense the risk you realize like I'm not getting anything out of this and it opens me up like it, it gives me more attack surface and so you like your gut told you like this is not worthwhile maybe but it also like I wasn't really sure what the mm, uh, uh, maybe I'll write a blog post about it. Somehow that's like different and less like, I don't know. Like the attack surface on a, on a blog post is so much smaller than a tweet thread because a tweet thread, like every single, like the, the interaction surface for a tweet thread is every single point that you make or every little piece and you can like get like, it like can spiral, right? Because everyone, like the attachability surface for like the interjection into the conversation is like very like, it's very open. Um, whereas like a blog post is like a monolith and you put it up there and like you either read and you comment at the bottom or you write another blog post, but it's more like chunky and hard to get knives into. Yeah. I, I love the attachability surface concept. It's almost like surface area. Like tweets have more surface area because it's each these like small individual things. And the blog post has a larger, yeah, yeah. it's like a different um, surface area to volume ratio. <laughs> Huh. Yeah, and like, like you can retweet a tweet out of context, sort of, but like blog posts, like not everyone will click into the blog post to read the whole thing. Like maybe you'll get some screenshots, but those are like, yeah. So it's and like I a blog post the... contains its own context, um, but this reminds me of um, something I've heard from explosives people. Like so I forget who it was who told me. It might have been my father-in-law who was an explosives guy in the uh, Air Force. Um, but apparently any substance, if you atomize it enough, it turns into an explosive accelerant. So you like <laughs> turn anything into a sufficiently fine powder, it'll burst into flames, assuming it's flammable at all. So that's basically it. Airline. And if you don't want it to explode, keep it in one big chunk. Yeah, right, exactly. I didn't want to like aerialize the thought process, even though like I really don't think it would be that explosive. But like, yeah, it's <laughs> like... Um, yeah, uh, unless you can sort of... Weirdly hide, like, I'm, metaphor. <laughs> I'm thinking of uh, things that are tweet sized and explosive potential, but hidden from view. Like look at uh, commit messages on open source project check-ins. I once reviewed like a bunch of like those log messages and some of them were like very pissed off and complainy, right? 
And it's like, yes, this could blow up. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Every time you bring up logs, it's just funny to me. We need to talk about logs when we get back around to L because I want to <laughs> yes. get into it. It's going to be fun. But yeah, I'm sorry. Do you guys ever try to rules lawyer a topic? Like come up with a different way to say it so that you can talk about it earlier? Like changing the terminology? Yes. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't do this. Benka does. But like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would expect to the rules a lot more. Wait, that's not true. I feel like there was one thing I was like trying to talk about Karl Marx under K because we were doing first names and then Vink has like, no, that's an M. And like, but we talked about Hannah Arendt under H. Anyways. <laughs> I think in that particular case, I felt Marx was a big enough topic that it should be like center stage in its own letter or something. But anyway, yeah, yeah we need rules lawyers for this. Yeah. Right. Oh, luckily, luckily, world lawyers abound. That's something the world has no shortage of. <laughs> so how are we doing on time? Do we have time for more topics or what? Mm, um, I think we're pretty much, uh, we've kind of hit time, but we could, we could talk more. Um, do we have, I'm getting we have close to talk out, but I could do like one more topic. We have one more topic, but this is a topic I feel like, I feel like I have to talk a lot for. Um, yes. <laughs> I think what is our last topic? The last topic is spot prices. It has to do with electricity markets. Um, yes. I think Ben Cat wants to hear this one. All right, Ben Cat, what do you want to hear about spot prices? Okay, yeah. So you've been tweeting about how you've been like uh, screwing over the Texas electricity <laughs> utilities by stealing electricity at low prices for them. So explain what spot pricing is and how you use it. Like, what do you? That's not true hacking? at all. I, I end up getting. I want you to know. I want everyone to know that I end up getting screwed by spot pricing more than anyone, sort of. But. Um, basically there's this, like, I feel like every time I talk about this, I'm like an advertisement for this single power company that like allows this sort of pricing in Texas called Gritty. Um, but, uh, basically, so Texas energy market is deregulated, which means that when you buy power, you get to shop around on the market and there's like, there's gotta be like 50 different providers that sell you different energy contracts. And they're all like, really rigged in different ways around like how much energy you think you are going to use and like these really interesting and like fun kind of problem ways so like all the websites that advertise so you can go to a website and like type in kind of what your average usage is and it'll show you all the options um and like little contracts you can go read all the like little things that they do and like the websites all show it sorry i'm this is like way off topic it's fine i'm gonna keep talking um but like uh the the websites show you like the they base it all around like an average amount of 2000 kilowatt hours of usage a month so every single like all the low cost ones if you go read the rules like they have like a really absurdly high number of like that they charge you per kilowatt hour so that's like that's like the base price right and so like it'll be like 12 cents and that's like just that's everything it's like 12 cents per kilowatt hour that you use um but they give you like a weird rebate that kicks in at like a thousand kilowatt hours of like a hundred dollars so that when you get to the two thousand dollar like two thousand kilowatt hour price the price looks amazing um but that's only because they've like added on these like weird kind of like bonuses for hitting certain numbers and as soon as you tip over two thousand kilowatt hours into whatever you're paying like a lot of money per kilowatt hour and it just gets kind of like weird anyway so there's like there's like a lot of vendors and they charge different prices and it's all like most of them are these contracts you sign on to and you're in them for like a year and if you quit early there's like an early quit thing anyways the one that i'm on does something really unique and weird and what they do is there's a texas has like this energy market run by a commission called ERCOT, which is like energy retail commission of texas um and they Basically, every five minutes, they see what the load is, like how much energy is being used in like your particular load zone. So I'm in like the Houston load zone um, and they and how much the supply is. So how much supply there is on the whole grid of Texas. And so Texas as like an energy grid is separated from every other state. It's like only Texas like is on the same energy grid. We're not like interconnected really in the same way that other grids in like the Northeast and like the West are. Anyways, so um they look at the inbound, like how much supply they have online and how much the demand is. And then like, there's like kind of like this bidding auction thing that happens. And every five minutes, the price gets updated depending on supply and demand. So on a really hot days when there's no wind blowing in West Texas, because a lot of our wind comes from wind power in West Texas. So there's no wind blowing and it's super hot outside and everyone's running their AC and we're all home because of quarantine. And it's the middle of summer. The spot price gets real high because there's a lot of demand and maybe not as much supply. 
Um, but like in the evenings or like at midnight, like a few days ago, the spot price was zero. So like my electricity price wasn't zero because there's like a base price that you kind of can't not pay, but it was as low as you could possibly pay um, electricity prices. So I accidentally got some fluorocarbons into my, like from spray paint. So like when you spray paint, like gas comes out of the can and expands a lot. And for reasons, I wasn't in a well-ventilated area and it all got into my house, um, into like the AC system and you can like smell it. So I needed to like flush out my AC system. So I waited until the spot price was like a cent or two um, and then opened all the windows and ran the AC. Cause like you can't just open your windows and run all the fans and not have the AC on. Cause that would just be miserable hot and like humid even at night. It's just like gross. So I need to like blast the AC full power so that it's spinning, like circulating and like have all the windows open. So the like, air is exchanging. And so since I was like, Oh, well like the energy price is like pretty low right now. I can figure out, Oh, it's going to cost me like a dollar 50 to run it for two hours. It's like, all right, let's go. Um, but like, it's like, you can only do that. Like, so if I was paying like these other things, right, I'd have to know, okay, what's my total load for the month going to be? And like, if I hit like the 2000, whatever thing, then it's like, it actually cost me like a lot more or whatever. But cause you've got the spot price thing, you're just, nope. All right. It's like this much money right now. Like let's crank it. Um, but it's cool. This, because, is like, like, <laughs> this is extreme couponing for engineers. <laughs> Isn't this the most cyberpunk thing? ever like this is like totally cyberpunk right spot pricing online using that to blast an ac and flush out your home this is like what is the definition you put in your blog post on your because uh, cyberpunk is high tech and low life right so Lisa yeah is pretty much high tech low life <laughs> yeah i mean basically yes but yeah i got to flush out my house it took two hours and it smelled great afterwards it was the right it was the right choice but yeah I mean, you kind of get screwed when you're if when it's really hot outside and you really want to run the AC, but it costs you like a dollar per kilowatt, so it's gonna be like ten dollars for like an hour of electricity. You're like, I don't know about that. Venka, you just made me realize that I feel like another important thing about cyberpunk that I didn't really write about is like jank factor, and it's like the the interfacing between like. The interfacing between the like huge legible institutional systems and then the like illegible kind of like hacker type individual like using jank as a sort of like way to attack the the systemized the, the like vast systemization of the like zaibatsu kind of capitalism etc yep, yep. uh, so you just uh, i think uh, came up with a new term for what bruce sterling calls uh, favela chic right so you've got gothic high tech and favela chic and um, you're describing jankiness as the sort of favela chic ecosystem around the gothic high tech big corporation. Yeah, it's like the interface point is going to be janky. It reminds me of like, um, although Lisa, I mean, obviously, I, like, I think what you're doing, I mean, it sounds legal. So yeah, <laughs> as far as I know, that's legal. <laughs> but it's like extreme um, planning. It's like... Um, it's within the, how do I put it, the letter of the law, but the spirit of the law, not yeah, so much. Yeah, oh, and the system is kind of premised on, like, most people not being like Lisa. Like, oh, if you have too many people like Lisa, Lisa the system doesn't work. Um, no, in this but, case, that's not true, because there's actually an entire industry that's basically what Lisa oh, yeah, does. There's, right. there's behind the meter battery storage, and these entire companies store up not energy, yet. right? That's so, coming. There's that's already there, yeah. Uh, but that's actually no. But, but I mean, no. Her her optimizing behavior though, when she when she like if if all if all users of air conditioning based their air conditioning usage on the, like uh, you know uh, oh, actually responded to the market, like then it well it, it would at least have different dynamics. But what I was trying to, kind of neither here nor there. What I was trying to get at is that there's like there's this inherent mismatch between the sort of favela chic like way of engaging, but also goals and, uh, and also, and like scale is wrapped up in it too. You have like the individual pitted against the system, but like the inter, like the interface point is going to have some sort of like translation jank. It, it yep. reminds me of like people, um, like doing illegal cable TV or whatever, where you just like run some wires around. Hmm. Interesting. Stealing Wi-Fi, And there's a mismatch. I have. Mm -hmm. Sci-hub, all the sci-hub, like oh, yeah, sci -hub when you have the internet. Game, yeah. 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 Huh. yeah. There, there's definitely something uh, there. It's like, uh, it just struck me that this is like what we were talking about, um, you know, 
critical commentary and discourse around a big corporation. This is like the technical version of that. So what Lisa is doing is almost like a three panel comic strip around the electricity industry, except it's done in like a technical hack as opposed to like a joke in a comic strip, right? So there's a, there's yeah, a little bit a of prank. that going on. It's not a prank. <laughs> <laughs> there's like some no thumbing to it. That's true, yeah. All right. Well, this was a very interesting conversation. Oh wait, Lisa, do you have more to say about spot prices? I kind of I hijacked the salience line. Oh no, it's no, I'm done talking about spot. I mean, I could keep talking about spot prices, but um, Lisa's you like, I'm never really Bitcoin, done talking uh, about spot prices. You mine Bitcoin when the price is uh, low, right? You've told me that you've uh, got a couple of miners in your garage and you run those when the price is low. Yeah. And that's, yeah. Price yeah. at zero dollars earlier today, so uh, that was some. I mean, almost free. It's not free electricity because of the damn base price. I'm like, I'm like, I'm sort of like, I think I'm about to be. I've like definitely become politicized around like the particular organization that charges the base price. I'm like, this is this has got to this has got to go. Like this is way too high. It's way too damn high. Like they're cutting into my profits on whatever. Like that's not nope. That I <laughs> the electricity is too damn high. Yeah, it's too damn know. pricey. It's not even, I'm not even paying for electricity. I'm paying for their maintenance of the wires to get it to me. And I'm just like, no, they should do it for cheaper. Like, it's fine. They'll probably have, uh, they don't have, they have net they don't metering have in Texas if you have like uh, solar panels and stuff. Like California has net metering that you can get paid yeah. by the utility for pushing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to get solar. It's actually like this okay. side project thing I'm working on. But like, so the, the energy provider I have will pay you at the spot price. So it's not net metering, but like, so if, you get like a huge price spike and you're making a lot and you turn out, you, you make, you, you want it to be a super sunny day and you're making some energy and you turn off all the electronics in your house and you just pump it back in the grid and make like five bucks, you know, like, uh, yeah. All right. Jank. Maybe I'm a little jank when it comes to electricity. Oh, shit. totally. Yeah. All your pro projects are like most hilariously janky. Like, uh, Oh, you, did you take, Oh, did you take Are you in a different room today? Is... No, I'm in the same room. Oh, it's okay. Like, it's, do you it. see that thing in the background, uh, Sonia? Uh, That's a Faraday cage playing? that she built. It's a Faraday cage that I sleep in. So That's neat. Lisa, what did you is, put in it? I don't know. I think I'm just like a. It's got a a, a thing on it because white. And it's like a huge tin foil hat because Lisa believes five G will kill her, so she built this thing to protect herself from five G. It's not gonna kill Good. Me. Like, you know, it's an experiment. Do I sleep better? Is my brain more rested after escaping from the, the EMP pulses? Uh, jury's still out. Uh, All right. Let us know how it works out. I've been sleeping great, so, you know. Um, it's because the AC Peace works. of mind. Priceless. Yeah. All right. So thanks a lot, Sonia, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. <laughs> cool. Um, oh, and people, uh, people listening to this, go, go to my website. It is soniasupposedly.com. S-O-N-Y-A and then the word supposedly.com. Yeah, and subscribe to Sonia's and zines and stuff. On yep. Sorry, what'd you say? I said so, subscribe to Sonia's zines. Yeah. You can get the whole bundle right now, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's a $30, bleh, $30 bundle at the moment. Yep. Very exciting. Everyone should go check it out. And don't you two, you two should plug your things. Oh, we, we do, do that every week. Oh, okay. It comes at the end. It's automated. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice. We Very have canned efficient. advertising. We have canned advertising that we tag on to the end, right? Yeah. yeah Beautiful. Sponsors. Um, great. Great. Again, Sonia, always a pleasure. Um, Bankat, also always a pleasure. Uh, and I'll see I'll see you next week, Bankat. All right. All right. All right. Bye. <laughs> Scorpio Season is proud to be sponsored by uh, Smoke and Screws, the premium filter for your glass pipes, water pipes, and one hitters. Check out their next generation screen technology at smokeandscrews.com. Uh, we're also proud to be sponsored by Art of the Gig a subscriber-only newsletter for freelancers and independent consultants. Learn more about how to take your consulting practice to the next level at artofgig.com. Uh, great. Um, and if you liked our show, don't forget to like and subscribe. <laughs>